Okay, I think we'll call it to order at 6.03. Um, welcome our guests. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hari. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Would you, um, do you care to speak tonight? And is um, public comments the place to do that? Or do you, do you have a particular topic you're here for? And, and you folks? No. Okay. Great. So, um, are there any agenda revisions? Looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we'll have time for public comments, please. Um, hi, I'm Ginger. I'm here tonight to express my opposition of removing Jim from Math White Table. I am talking on behalf of the 9th to 12th graders and myself. I have here with me a poster from a variety of students, of high school students who do really well in classes and students who struggle a little bit more, who have written why gym at Math White Table matter to them. I have encouraged you all to take some time to read every response. These responses are students who have connected with Jim and believe that he has impacted their math skills. Along with my peers, Jim has aided me in every way possible. I enter the room and he calls me Ginger Snap. I go to him two to three times per week to either reassess on tests or get more help that wasn't provided in my math class. Every time I go into Math White Table, he has a, he has a smile on his face that brightens everyone's day. He sits down one-on-one -on -one with each person and helps them from start to finish. Most cases I am there because the pace is too fast in my class or because I simply don't understand the material. By the time I leave his room, I have a better understanding and gotten a few laughs from him. Before I, know, uh, before I knew about Math White Table, I was debating between getting a math tutor outside of school. I feel like I don't need to any, anymore because of Jim. Last year, Jim was awarded the ESP of the year for a reason. I have not met one student who doesn't like him. That is rare for all of the student body to like a teacher. Jim has helped many students and losing him in our math department will be detrimental to us, the students. Yeah, Would you like to pass that around? Sure. Wait, like, yeah, I Thank you. So okay. my name is Jennifer Micah. I'm a parent of two children, who one of whom has graduated and one of whom is a junior. And I'm speaking also on the cuts in the budget for the math support. I did provide a written um, email to the members of the board, as well as Bill Kimball and um, Stephen Dillinger Pate. And um, in that email, I laid out sort of my general concerns about the issue. And I would reiterate that, and I would reiterate the issues of equity that are the most pressing issue for me. Um, I, I have enough money to send my kids to a tutor, but there are lots of kids, lots of kids at school who cannot afford to do that. I would be willing to bet none of you sitting at this table today can't afford to send your kid to a tutor if there's nobody at U32 who can help them. And it is the case that there are teachers on your math, in your math program who are not approachable, and you need to address that issue before you start taking away supports. Secondly, in 2016, you were here discussing a very similar issue around the science curriculum. And I am curious whether you have ever reviewed the impact of those decisions on your science uh, grading. Of how are the kids doing? Have, have the kids done better because of the cuts that you made? Have they done worse or have they stayed the same? And if you haven't done an, that analysis, then you shouldn't be taking the same step in another program until you do. Those are my two main points, and I hope that you will really reconsider this issue and look at, if you are going to be cutting direct service providers, then you should also be cutting administration. When you are cutting direct service, then you are raising administration costs. Every other budget line in your budget is going up if you are cutting a direct service provider because you are still providing the same amount of money, but it's being dispersed differently and it's being taken away from direct service. And if there's one thing that every kid and every parent can agree on, is that what we care about is the quality of the teachers and the adequacy of the staff in the school. 
We don't really care if you don't have enough administration. That's a problem for you guys. Administration's not gonna come forward and tell you that they need to be cut. And so you need to do it even if they're not recommending it. I hope you will take Ginger's concerns into, um, into you, your thoughts in, in, and reconsider your decision to cut, especially the white table, and also you, you need to reconsider your paraprofessionals and whether you really can afford to lose them. You are looking at, you are looking at the middle tier, your tier two students, who are gonna be most directly impacted by the steps that you're taking in this budget. So I ask you to reconsider and put back the direct service and look at other ways of cutting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Public comment? All right, we will move to consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of March 20th and March 27th? I'll move. Scott? I'll second. Karen? Any comments? <clears throat> you seem good. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstention? Okay, so that passes. Um, and our next topic is receive questions regarding the budget vote. We didn't prepare a presentation, but this is the time to talk about um, the proposed U32 budget um, that will be voted on next Tuesday by the five tenths. Are any of you folks here uh, regarding this, the budget? Go ahead. So I heard today what she said, that, you know, I, I'm concerned that we're cutting, uh, you know, teachers that are, you know, directly, you know, educating students and we're not cutting anything else, like sports or anything else, and, you know, of course. Yeah. School size is getting smaller, and we need to cut back in some other areas. But I'm concerned that we're cutting back in direct ser educational services to our students. Yeah, I'd, I'd say we share that concern. Um, just a little history on on this proposed budget. We had asked the administration to develop an, a budget that showed expense increase of no more than three percent, um, and with the reduction in students. Um, equalized pupil, that translates to about 4.1% increase per pupil, um, which is, I, you know, I think is at around the, the most that we're willing to go, um, at least this cycle. So in order to, to achieve that, um, we had to reduce in several areas, um, and it includes, I think, seven positions in total. Most of those are paraprofessional. There is a, um, a food service position in there as well. Um, and the, the other guidance that we, that we provided was that we didn't want to reduce any um, licensed classroom teachers if that was possible. And th this proposed budget does that. So I think from you know, our discussions that it kind of met the parameters that we set. Karen. Well, and speaking to this topic, I mean, I'm thrilled at the passion, uh, outreach, and communication that we've gotten about cutting this position. Um, but I don't know that the board, so the board's role is to provide the strategic vision, the core values, where we want the direction, budget guidelines, but not get down in the weeds on how that's done. It's up to our administration, administrators to come to us with a plan of here's how we can do it without losing quality. And what we were communicated was that um, certified math teachers who were educated in teaching the best would be filling the role of the white table and the white table would not go away. So that the support for the students, the ability to get that help at the white table would still exist, period. And it would exist by completely trained teachers. Um, we all who went to our workshop this summer learned a lot about from our speaker or all day workshop about how paraeducators are not necessarily taught, qualified, certified at the level to teach things. What we found out is our white table has been the exception. We've been very fortunate that we've had retired math teachers to staff it. But that is not always guaranteed. That is not the case in most schools and most paraeducator positions. And 
the decision to, that it felt like it was a correct decision to support what administration had brought to us. Have I got that right? I think so. So as much as I appreciate the concern that me as a board member should be pushing back and saying, no, no, you're wrong. You don't know what you're doing, administrators. You gave me a really bad plan. I'm not sure that's the case. I think we've had a bad communication plan about how the white table was going to still exist, potentially. Um, and even even providing uh, an example of, here's what we think might happen, but there you go. So, other questions about the budget? I just, I wanna um, uh, speak to what you said, Karen, because um, largely what, I, what you said I agree with, that uh, I wanna stay out of the issue of in, involving ourselves in decisions on education. Um, and in that sense, uh, I reluctantly, I think, still support the decision of the, of the uh, administration to cut Jim's position. But what I think uh, uh, both Ginger and Jennifer, and I don't, I didn't catch your name, but- uh, Richard Smith. No, I know you, Richard, the, the fellow <laughs> behind. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I think what you've exposed something that is near and dear to my heart, which is that uh, I think as uh, policy setters, we need to reconsider, uh, revisit the issue of what our school community consists of. I think it consists of more than just teachers and students and administrators. I think different, te different students are reached by different sorts of adults with whom they interact, and it may be a uh, retired teacher who doesn't have the same kind of uh, gravitas as uh, the regular math teacher, since, for instance, he's not assigning grades to those who see him. It could be somebody in cafeteria. It could be a coach who isn't a teacher at all. I think we want to have a diverse community, and you know, we can't have a very diverse community given how uh, homogeneic we are, but we should strive for a diverse community uh, uh, for our students that includes, I believe, paraeducators and, um, and folks like Jim at the math board. So, so that's kind of a weird way of me, my saying that I think at this point, I want to support the decision of our principal to make this cut, but I think we need to go back and think about whether we want to be so monochromatic in our um, in in the community we create. Um, uh, I'm just wondering: Are there circumstances in which we would intervene and um, and sort of reverse a decision of this sort? And if so, what would those circumstances be? Hard to answer that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sort of layering on to what Charlie said, uh, I think one thing we may not be addressing with this is the fact is the topic we're talking about is math. And you mentioned approachability to people. Well, one of the big problems when people struggle with math, male or female, females more, is something called math anxiety. It's a real thing. I was I laughed at first, and then there are psychology articles. Um, the National Institute for Health has this huge article spotlight on math anxiety. This is a real issue. So you come to the table of getting this complicated material to learn and master and be proficient in, and your anxiety kicks in, and it starts young. It starts really young. And I don't know that guidance-wise or support-wise, counselor-wise, I mean, I'm not aware of what we're doing to help with that. I think we have a lot of good guidance at U32, but, do, you know, there's a spotlight on that part of it, because if you can come to the table with your anxiety about the math alleviated, you're in a better place to learn. And, and it's, a, it's a real phenomenon. It's actually a mental health disorder, and it's extremely hmm. common. It's something like 40 to 50% of female students will um, confess to that. Wow. In, the, in the United States. In the United right. States. But internationally, it's not. Right, right. So <laughs> it's, part, it's just societal pressure. Hmm. And I'm not saying it isn't, a, Phenomenon it is, but it, it's the way math is perceived, having done a lot of work in math education in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's the, some of the ways in which we teach math. Right. Starting at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Scott, um, 
this is pretty hard to ignore. And, and when we say, you know, we're all about the kids, this is the kids, um, you know, their, their testimony. And I can tell you that I've heard from, um, from others as well who, um, including one in Nicaragua who, um, who also said that, that that Jim was the only reason that she was able to, to get by in calculus. Um, so it, it appears to me that we have here um, an extraordinary resource. And um, even though, I know, the, the cemeteries are filled with irreplaceable men, um, on the other hand, as long as they're not in cemeteries, <laughs> maybe we should take advantage of them <laughs> and, um, and keep them where, where they're very clearly making a tremendous contribution. Okay, well, I'd like to bring it back to the budget and see if there's any other questions or discussion around the budget next week. But uh, well, I, I am curious. I mean, Scott had a good question. When do we uh, sort of uh, cross that <clears throat> line and consider uh, consider an amendment to the budget, given the uh, given the seeming, the seeming groundswell of support for uh, Jim? A hard question. Yeah, I, again, I don't know. I would, I, for me, it would start with the question of what is the impact of the student learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. That, that to me is the guiding star. Okay. And if you can show that one reduction has an outsized impact there, um, that was my question when when we were talking about about these reductions. Uh, was it two weeks ago? And the response that we got was something along the lines of, we're creating a plan to provide that function, of the white table function. Um, I was satisfied with that, but, um, you know, that's, that's my answer. I, I think, I, I'll get just a moment. Um, it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be an amendment to the budget, though. It could be a, a different just way to achieve that same budget, oh. a different plan. Um, same question. When would we sort of overrule the plan and say that's not acceptable? Plan? I'd encourage us to think in terms of student management. Um, I know um, from Ginger's um, card, you've gotten sort of a perspective about um, how impactful Jim has been. But I would also like to say, um, I understand you're in like a super tough position with the budget. I think we all appreciate the work you're doing. Um, but if you were to cut Jim's position, I think that some improvements would need to be made within the math department because I think part of the reason why so many people go to Jim is because he explains it in a different way and that's really valuable, especially like you're talking about with like math anxiety, if you're not understanding something, having a math teacher just repeat it to you the same way isn't gonna help you. And I think that's why Jim is so valuable in our community because he also is just like has the ability to make you feel a little bit more equal and a little bit like less stressed out because it's just a more casual environment, so I think if you were to have to cut his position, like some serious improvements would need to be made regarding how we are taught math and sort of how we are like helped when we're behind or when we need extra support. It, you know, okay, so that was my question. Are you referring to both the tier one classroom instruction and the tier two white table type of extra support? Like the, what, what do you mean? Like in terms of accessibility and presenting the information in a way that Jim has a particular yeah. talent for? So, I mean, for me, Jim has helped me um, with just, like, the regular stuff I'm supposed to be learning in class. Like Ginger said, like, if you're going too fast or if you miss class, he can help you on, like, a basic level of, like, okay, go to his room, take the quiz that you missed. But he can also help you on a deeper level of, like, if you just really don't understand something, he can sort of, like, flip it around. And, like, he's taught for, like, so many years, so he kind of knows all the ways to do things. And he can tailor it specifically to your needs, which yeah. I think is really valuable. He yeah. just has a lot of years of experience in the field. Got it. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I guess I just want to clarify from where I stand. 
This isn't really about Jim from right. where we sit. This is about the position of a paraeducator sitting at the white table. And, it, you know, we could probably ask the administration to tinker with the budget this year and scrape and eke somewhere else to keep Jim on board one more year. But next year, it's only going to be harder. And the year after that, it's only going to be harder. And in 10 years, we're going to have a staff that vastly outsized it. We need to right size the school, or we're going to end up in a serious hole. And it's really hard when it's somebody who's great at their job and that we love. But it's really the position we're speaking to, not the person here. And, and those of us who've been on the board for a while know that reductions are the norm. That's that's the climate that we're in. Your enrollment is projected just out. You heard it earlier this year when we work on the budget. Yeah. In current kindergarten, 77 kids you know, graduate on 128. And that's li pretty linear all the way up to the grade levels. I, I thought I saw Jennifer. Can I have two questions? I have two questions. One is um, when was the last time um, you cut administration and, and where and how much did it impact the budget? And um, two is, uh, where is the money for the new track? Is that in the budget? And um, if so, I might ask why. So I believe the answer to the first question is we cut a half-time administrative, a vice principal. Last year. Last year. Was it last year? Yeah, it was last it year. seems longer yeah. than half. Yep. Okay. And uh, that was your question? Half-time director of special ed, like two years before that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the so the the track is a, the money for the track is a combination of a money that was set aside from this year's fund balance, and then there is additional capital funding um, in the proposed budget as we normally do. We always set aside a certain amount. Um, for ongoing improvements, and and a large share of that is um, earmarked for the track. So. And that, is that still fifty thousand dollars a year? No, it's it's around it's almost close to five hundred thousand dollars a year that goes into capital uh, cap to keep the capital up. That you know, it's a, this board years ago set in into a capital capital plan that's twenty years out for work that's done in this building and never to get back to a bonded place for two to three years from being, for our bonds being fully paid off. Right, so the track is a million dollars, right? Yep. And so, it, and it's scheduled to last for 20 years. And so if it's, it's a million dollars and it's 20 years, it's $50,000 a year. We're paying $50,000 a year for a track. Just to be clear, right? In the way you're presenting, yes. I can say that I asked that same value. question. That's a value I can say that I asked that same question, um, and um, the overwhelming response was, you know, this track is used by so many um, that it's just not um, a track for kids at school um, that are that are going to run on it. Um, that it's more of a community piece um, and larger. It's more of a state piece, if if you want to look at it that way, um, with the different groups that use it. So. But, but you're absolutely right. We're making a we're making a decision about about that investment. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. So um, next up is board norms. So Charlie had volunteered to do an update. Um, do you want to introduce this? Oh right. Um, <clears throat> from your notes. Uh, of the meeting, uh, it wasn't clear to me exactly how much leeway I should take with this. And <laughs> once one puts pen to paper, one tends to go kind of, uh, one, there's no, there's no, uh, no pleasure like the pleasure of being an editor. So I sort of went to town and did a lot of changes on it. What you have is both a clean version, behind that it's a track changes version. On it. Uh, just to run through it quickly, the first the first issue is communicate. I wasn't sure what we meant by our, our former, uh, our, the current board, board member, but I took it to mean that um, 
that what we want to do is we want to express, say for instance, somebody speaks to me about an issue, right. I want to give that to the rest of the board and, and, uh, and the public. So I rewrote that to say that uh, fellow board members and, uh, and uh, we'll communicate to fellow board members of the public board related comments were received by individual board members since the last meeting. Community involvement during the meeting. I kind of, I went a little further perhaps than the rest of the board would want to, but I wrote community members have a right to participate in discussion items after the board has had its discussion. In general, board wishes, uh, the board wishes to accord attendees ample time to express their views. However, time limits may be necessary to adhere to the meeting schedule. I want the default to be that people can speak as long as they, as they need. Stay on time. Board members will endeavor to stay uh, to certain end on time. The timekeeper may be named for each meeting to assist board members meeting this goal. All board members will be heard. Each board member has a right to speak. Some talk that's warrant having each board member speak in turn to ensure full representation. Tension resolution. In the event tensions arise among board members, the chair will summarize the conversation and the positions voiced by participating members to prevent the appearance that the last speaker's views became the position of the board. Announcements. Why don't we ever need that? Did I? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, announcements and report. I'm not sure if we meant reports. If I put a side note there, do we mean minutes or agenda? Maybe uh, announcements in agenda. Announcements from the administration will appear in the agenda as feasible and not as discussion. I think that's what we meant, but I didn't make that change because I wasn't sure what, what was meant by that section. I don't want to report as I, I, I think it's when, you know, in the section reports to the board, you know, administrate the administrative report. I think that's what that's ah, referring okay, to. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah. Okay. That, all right, fair enough. So it should stay as it is. Yeah. Review by the board, time permitting in the end of each. Now, I changed this. This is role of the board, and that was the one that you may recall that I, that's this, that I had, uh, I felt most problematic. I think our role is clearly explicated in the law. Uh, and so what I think we're really driving at is that, uh, that the time permitting at the end of each meeting, the board will reflect on whether the board adhered to its statutory functions stated in uh, 16 BSA 563, a copy of which is attached and it isn't, sorry about that. Um, just so that, to get to the same idea that we won't, we won't, like Karen said, get into the business of educating. Uh, respect one another, so celebrate successes, three before me, allow for think time, share concerns, assume positive intentions, avoid judgmentalism. <laughs> I don't know who would possibly be guilty of that. Uh, be present physically and cognitively and include everyone. All right, discussion? No questions? No questions about this? I'd really like to see 16 BSA. Yeah. Sorry about that. I can pull it up for you right away. How long is it? It's long. Oh, it's long. Uh, no, it's it's a <laughs> and then it also has that catch-all that says... Uh, is there an executive summary? <laughs> no, it, it's duties. Well, it starts off with policy. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's not anything that you're not familiar with. But I'll pull it up if you really want to talk about it. I apologize for not having it. Right. It might have something to say about when we should intercede in an issue such as math white table. Mm. Okay. Any, any other uh, questions? I really like the way it reads. I think it captures a lot of what yeah. our intent was. Good. How will other people feel similarly? Yeah. Any suggestions for improvement? What do we want to do? Do we want to adopt tonight? We want to sleep on it? I'm going to accept. Okay. Any motion, Karen? Second? Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, second. <laughs> Discussion? Guess, um, I think it's been more thought about than yeah. probably yeah. it. Right, and, when, yeah. and then this would become part of the packet that we would uh, be able to reflect on each, each meeting. So the first is to does the school board or school district in addition to other duties and authorities specifically, specifically assigned by law. That's the funny part. They always do that. So we've got to look elsewhere too. 
shall determine the educational policies of the school district. Board policies will be made and yada, yada, yada. You can read the rest later, but that, that's point number one. Uh, it out and get it to you. Okay. I have one quick question too. Are we? Are, do we vote already? Or? No, we have not voted. Discussion. This doesn't really isn't germane to this particular issue, okay. but I would have I would have liked to have sent this to the board, yeah. so that you could read it beforehand. Yeah, but I want to be very careful about uh, violating public records or right. meetings laws. Right. So I think maybe that's one of the policies that I want to work at first. I think it probably is, in my view, it's fine for me for us to distribute. Something like this for a meeting, or mm -hmm. yeah, correct. Right. Yeah. 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 So um, that's what. Yeah, we've done that before. Yeah. yeah. I mean, preferred practice is to get it in the packet, which usually goes out the Friday before. Right. But if you yeah. don't, yeah. And, and it often happens, then okay. we'll have people send it directly. Okay. Just as long as we don't get into a back right. and forth. Distributing it is fine, but the back and forth comment for I'd like this edit, this yes. edit, that's the part where you're not allowed to do it. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. The advice they give to everyone in my municipality is uh -huh. to make sure we're on the same board. Okay. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Just to, it, if we transgress these norms, obviously not deliberately ever, but um, there are no enforcement mechanisms, presumably. It, it's um, something to discuss. Because uh -huh. right. I remember Charlie was talking last time about aspirational. Um, is that that's basically right. I think we agreed on that yeah we, I think we agreed it's sort of like reading your mission and vision at the beginning of each meeting or having it on the wall so that when you're at your board meeting you are sort of focused this is just reminding yeah a lot of, of a lot of boards will reflect at the end of the meeting how did the meeting go and then this would be one of the standards we would kind of consider ourselves against but yeah. we don't really have that practice any other all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention? No. Okay, so those are our norms. Thank you. All right, can I ask a couple of just operational yeah. things? Yes. Do you want it right behind the agenda so it's on the second page? I think so. Yeah. Uh, can you send me the PDF? Uh, sure. Oh, well, actually, yes. Either yeah. or I'll take order to it. I'm not doing PDF, but you would want it. Okay. We'll make sure it's in the back <clears throat> okay. all the time right behind the agenda. Okay. So it's always there for you. Okay. And, uh, I can get the same 16. Look at the essays 563. Okay, said, and get that out to the board as well. Okay. Okay. Was that it, Phil, or did you have something else? No, I just wanted to ask operationally how you wanted this done. Yeah, so we, I, I like having it right in the packet right after the agenda. It's a good reminder. Seems to work. So we also put the top in 4 3 on the top here. All right, the next item is the school board observations. And so let me take a crack at introducing this. It, this is a, something that we typically talk about this time of year. I think most, most of us are familiar with this, but we've talked about in the past, how do we monitor student learning outcomes? How do we understand if we're making progress? And we've talked about having three different kinds of sources of data. One would be the internally prepared reports, like the monitoring report that we got last fall from Bill that had a range of data and evidence. Um, there's also external sources of data, so that could be like testing, or we've had audits performed of different programs that we do, or there's another example. Integrated field review that the agency does every three years right. that's required. So you're having outside experts come in and sort of review your programs and, and give the board evidence about, you know, are, are, we, are we on track? And then the third one is a little bit um, different. It's somewhat unusual, but um, we've been practicing this for a while. It's this school board direct observation. Um, and I remember when we had Brent Kay and he was the superintendent of the um, Randolph. Orange, Orange Southwest. Or sounds that was about this. Um, he really made the point that sort of crystallized it for me. He said that you know, education is so complex that it really is helpful for boards to have this third source to actually be looking for themselves to see are are we seeing evidence of um, of of 
of, of students um, learning these outcomes or performing these or achieving these outcomes, I guess, is a, is a thing. And so we've created this form um, as a way to um, sort of organize that. And at different times, we've asked board members to attend um, different opportunities to observe where the learning outcomes might be demonstrated. Um, and this is a particularly good time of year for that because it's, we're going into the part of the year where it's the culmination of, of different activities and, um, and class work. And, um, and so um, I guess one question would be, you know, what opportunities does the board, is the board going to have in the next couple months to, to do some of this observation so that we can sort of report back um, and, uh, and talk about what we what we observed. So I guess I would ask if, if we could get a calendar of that. And we can do that. Sorry, we should have put a calendar. We gave mm -hmm. one last year uh, about this time, right. different opportunities. But there's things um, that are happening, and Jody can help me fill in quite a deal around here, quite a bit around here. But we're getting to uh, branching out presentation, pilot presentations, uh, the school play that's happening. Um, you know, I would think even something like next week when we have the college fair and kids are there working, looking at post-secondary opportunities. Um, and, and many of you participated in many different things, whether it's coming to a class or uh, seeing some of the, or the mentor celebration was another one you, yeah, you had said the mentor to me. celebration, the arts night. Um, we have a music festival we'll be hosting this year. Yeah. So that'll be a very exciting opportunity for our students and others. So, so the idea is we come watch you in class. Yeah. <laughs> I think Algebra Algebra 2 STEM is doing some presentations tomorrow. If you're free tomorrow, end of the school day, 1.30 to 2.30. Um, they're preparing for their actual presentations, I think, over the weekend at the competition. So we can definitely get you a calendar and yeah. put that together. I know there are a lot of discussions, like uh, different clubs around the school are hosting mm -hmm. discussions too. I know Seeking Social Justice is having one, they're having a bunch within the next few weeks, and BLAM is actually having one this Friday right. during callbacks. So and, happening and, a lot. I, and I forgot about the BLAM diversity yeah. in May event. Ginger. Oh, yeah, diversity. Ginger just left, she would have been a great one to speak to that. Um, she's 17. been talking with me about that. Yeah, that'll be May 17th. I've been helping out with that too. Yeah. Cool. So there's, yeah, there's a lot going on. So it ends up being kind of an invitation to get in and see more things than we're, we're accustomed to. Good time of year for that. And you can see the rubric here is pretty simple. We're just looking at a three-point scale. And, um, and it kind of encourages you to look at, look at uh, things in a little bit different way you know, and really frame it in terms of the student learning outcomes. Yeah. So I could do one retroactively, but um, <laughs> from the eighth grade play, what when we fill it out, what do I do with it? Typically, you would bring it in, and um, we'll, we'll compile them. But okay. it, if there's, you know, we can have a discussion too, and you report out what you okay. what you saw. Sometimes we've done them in common, like if there's a, a presentation by students at a board meeting, and then we can actually have a discussion where we're all talking about the same thing that we observed. <clears throat> and that's pretty rich. But. But if it's just an individual one, bring it in, and we can have a discussion about it. We can compile it. I, I, I mean, that's sort of the system that's been used, right? Right. It's, that's all we've been doing with it is to sort of spur the discussion. And do we see an opportunity for students to present that they had learning in that area? It's not so much to judge to what degree did they learn, but was there learning opportunities along the student learning outcomes, and can they present them? And sometimes, a lot of times, when it's a presentation, it's easier to look at the transferable skills and the communication problem solving. Right. Right, right. We're working together. Yeah. Okay, any questions about that? Takes a little practice. Sounds, sounds neat. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next item is we have a letter from the student on page eight. Cora McMahon of the Green Team. There are actually three others of a similar, in a similar vein. That, letters. Um, letters. So what I would propose is that I could draft up response okay. to the letters. But where did the other letters end up? Did you get them? Um, I got them. No, okay. so the last meeting that you received, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, yes. that's what I thought. And, and they're about food waste? 
Um, they're about various environmental issues, including okay. uh, climate change, and, but and are, are all related to U32 practices. Okay, and are they all green team members, do you know? Um, I don't know if they're all green team members. Okay. Yeah. They are. Ah. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Thanks. Um, oh, but, well, that sounds great. I mean, is there any comments about, about this actual letter that we all got a chance to read? I thought it was great. I, I, I would have preferred that if I wanted, I wanted to say, so I recommend you do this. Right. So teaching experience for the for the young fellow. You should. You should. I, I loved everything he said, but he needed a conclusion. He needed to give us an idea, which I suspect Scott is going to do. <laughs> now I will. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> I think I know. So, <laughs> so we don't know if this, if all the letters were from green team members, but would there be any interest in inviting the green team to come speak to us? Sure. It actually Absolutely. might be an opportunity for board observation. Mm -hmm. we'll see how that that group is working and how it, how it uh, marries with our student learning outcomes. Do you think they'd be open to? Yes. Uh, Ellen, <laughs> yeah. Ellen, are you the advisor? She's one of them. That's great. So that, yes, I'm saying I'm volunteering then. <laughs> awesome. So either May or June, mm -hmm. first, Please. first Wednesday, that would be great. Okay. Great. So, uh, Scott, you're going to work on that and yes. get that up? Yes. Faster than my FPF. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make sure that Stephen and I work with Ellen to figure out the schedule. All right, we're going to move on to 3.5, the five practices of teaching at U32. And Stephen shared an email, I think, with all of you about those practices. Did you want that repeated in any way, shape, or form? So it's proficiency-based, problem-based, trauma-informed, uh, restorative practices, and teaching. Those are the practices. Is it problem-based or project-based, or is that the project. same thing? Well, it's project-based <clears throat> unless it's math, then it's problem-based. Yeah. Um, they're right. relatively the same thing, okay. um, but project is a little more wide open, whereas in math, a lot of times it's related to the problem, and, and there may be only one way to solve the problem. So that's why it has to be. I'm going to be able to log in here. And um, Mia and Lucy and Ellen are all helping with this restorative practices piece. Ellen and I are both certified trainers for the International Institute for Restorative Practices out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And we provide all of the training and have been doing so here for our faculty um, around restorative practices. So we're going to do an intro lesson. It's usually a two-day training. We're going to pack as much into 15 minutes as we can as soon as I get logged in. So patience, maybe uh, Ellen could lead a opening a circle. <laughs> How, how long have you been using restorative practices? Um, uh, well, uh, eight years. We, uh, when, um, I would say, well, I first went to my first training in restorative practices in the World Conference about eight years, eight summers ago, and I, uh, it made a lot of sense that we could help use this practice to help improve um, social capital in the building. And, uh, and so at that time, uh, we happened to be needing to rewrite our action plan. And so we, myself and Lisa and, um, and Tim Flynn, who was the head of the special ed in our building, um, put our heads together and wrote it into the action plan. And then slowly I contracted with um, folks at UVM and began trainings with volunteers, and that went on for about two years, and then Stephen came, and didn't, I added you know, another training, and then we decided that it would be part of, really part of the fabric. So trained some teachers, a handful of teachers and students in the beginning over a few years, and did largely um, proactive circles, just team building, it's all about connection, connecting to adults, connecting to kids, um, and there we go, that's how we've, so we started. Uh, it's pretty exciting, and uh, it was. We were one of the first schools in Vermont to in public schools in Vermont to begin using restorative practices. UVM had um, had been using it for several years in all of their 
um, dormitories and part of their human services coordination efforts at the university. So, uh, as, uh, and over the last few years, and now it's a statewide initiative, which is pretty neat, and folks have, so the folks have been working on this for a long time. And there's sort of justice circles as well. Right. Yeah. Right. And now, where and do we now, stand for training? Say that again? So why don't you tell, let the board know a little bit about where we stand for training now. With where we stand for training, oh, thanks, thanks, Bill. Yeah, so um, <laughs> all faculty are trained, and uh, so Jody and myself, and, um, our trainers, we're trainers, um, and on the first two days, which is introduction to restorative practices and introduction to, to restorative circles, and um, and and so and Jody's also now has the certification for introduction to restorative conferencing, and I'm yet to get that. Uh, so that will be another tool. Those that's two more days of training. And uh, and then all new faculty are trained as well, and there's a and students. Um, are trained as well, not all students. Uh, so we we also train Bill we, and, and Bill Jen at Central Office. Yes, and, and some and some of our elementary, elementary yes. and, yeah, and, students. And, and students. Yes, and Kelly has done the training with you down in Berkeley. Yeah, yes, well. and so it would be great if that the whole district we just let us know we'll shut up. That. We're getting there now. Yeah. So for our piece today, we're hoping that we can help the board and anyone else out here in the audience to understand the role of restorative practices in building community. That's really what the focus was in bringing it here. Um, also, the four explicit practices of this, which we're going to go through, those are the main components of today's piece, and how to use prompts to facilitate responsive circles. So we're not expecting you to be able to do this. We're not asking anyone to go out and do that, although Lucy's going to be doing that prompt part, so chances are you're going to be well ready for that. Um, we actually have nine students trained in the school that do facilitate restorative circles from now and then with their peers. We haven't had a lot of opportunity to do that this year, um, but when they do, it's phenomenal. And we also have five uh, fifth and sixth graders, uh, three from Callis, two from Romney, who um, have been trained and I'm super excited for them to be coming up, some of them next year to start a panel in our middle school as well. So hopefully that work will happen. And just to clarify on the facilitate responsive circles, so that's when something has happened that has caused harm. And uh, so that is um, different from proactive circles, which are more like team building and connecting language. So the, the basic foundation of restorative practice is that we're all better off if we're working together on something instead of having something done to you or for you. Um, and I often in trainings will use the example of, I'm gonna feel much better if my son decides to clean his room on his own than if I force him to clean it somehow or I clean it for him. It's like that 46. <laughs> Could be, Scott. Yes, but <laughs> love, love, uh, it yes, would be great for us to do this all together. <laughs> um, so the aim of restorative practices is building community and then being able to manage the conflicts that occur within that community and restore the relationships. So this, this is um, the social uh, the social discipline went up. Now, the, we, Jody and I specifically use the training techniques and we add other things to it from the International Institute of Restorative Practices. So this is Worldwide, if I go to Australia or if I go to Peru or wherever, and they are using social uh, the social discipline window, it is this, and um, so the idea is that to increase social capital, which means p allowing us all to be heard and be validated, and and um, is that we have to be working with each other, and when we're working with each other, we have a high degree of control and a high degree of support, and so. When all of us, in general, move throughout the social discipline window at any times in our lives, and so one during the training, what we do is we put we put a big uh, some painters tape on the floor and we make up make the social dis discipline window up, and then what we use different prompts and then put ourselves in which box and how we might respond to things. So that is a um, it's helpful when especially when there's we have to have difficult conversations to really be able to identify what box are we operating from. And so often, especially in the parenting role that I can 
probably say for myself, there have been several times that I have been in the two box. It doesn't go so well. Uh, there have been times that I'm in the not box, just like I'm not dealing. Or I'm going to do this for you, possibly in the, like, the room cleaning scenario. It's because that's what I want. Mm -hmm. And then, guess what? Avery, that's my son, is 21, and he still has a terrible room, but I don't have to live in it anymore. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so when we're all working with each other, that's the whole idea of increasing everybody's social capital. I think and the recognition that there are times when you have to be in one box or the other. The, the point of the restorative box is that there's really high expectations, but there's also the support to get there. Mm -hmm. And so if you have high expectations and no way to support, then that's in that neglectful box. If you have um, <clears throat> high, sorry, high is punitive. And if it's low and low, it's neglectful. And if it's really like, I'm supporting you all the time, I'm doing it for you sort of thing, it's in that permissive if you're not setting those high expectations. And that there are times when we're gonna be in any one of those boxes and that's not necessarily wrong, but that as long as we're continuing to try to work towards that high expectations and the high support, then that's, that's where we wanna be. Yes, the ground is much more stable to stand on when we're with each other. Um, so that's one explicit piece of it, the social discipline window. The other is fair practice and the basically Again, it's working together and feeling like you've had the engagement, you have the explanation, you're, you're clear on what the expectations are. So you may, not, you may not have a role in making a decision, but you know why it was made, your voice was heard in some way, even if it didn't sway the vote, so to speak, um, and that you understand the expectations around it. Right, this is not consensus. It's not consensus. Um, this, is, this work is largely derived from the fact that we all have affects. That's kind of what we're born with. So um, babies make the same faces in the, when they're hit with something as we do. So it's, those are the innate biological pieces. Then we have an awareness that that affect is present. That's what we call the feelings. And then we have that response to it that we develop over time. And that's the emotion piece. And this um, scale of affects that they use through IIRP, I always get a few questions out of this, but what's interesting to think about is that the surprise startle is considered like this, it says neutral, but it's like the reset button. And anything that surprises or startles you, it can either point to the positive or it can toss you down into the negative, depending on what happens. And so it's that, that moment where you're like taken aback or something happens and unexpected and you either like, oh, it's a great thing, or it's, that's the question that that's usually arises. Yeah, it's that. pretty awful. It's like, you yeah, repulsive. Yeah, so these are all drugs. Also, these responses are, um, our bodies often respond to these based on whatever else is in the room, whether we have, whatever our responses are for previous experiences. And there's also a neuro, neurobiological response, which is typically from, um, limbic system and these the, in its direct correlations to trauma responses as well so and then also we can reset like jo like jody said that when i'm surprised it, i'm i'm more when i am surprised for myself by something i'm more often to go up to the positive affects and my startle response is may bring me down to places that i'm going to have to climb out of depending on what else is re-triggered in that response Certainly a lot of people think about the fact that it's easier to remember negative things and I think it's because we get, there's so many more negative affects that we can be pushed into. And so having those linger with you sometimes. This is one of our favorites, <laughs> Compass of Shame. Um, it is, uh, so the thing, we, we, in addition to this, so this, this is um, based on uh, someone, if you're familiar with some of the indigenous work, this is largely, um, has cultural context in indigenous communities around the medicine wheel and, um, uh, and circle of courage work. And so uh, when we feel shame, shame is quite different from guilt. Guilt is something we know we've done something, you know, wrong, if you will and shame is that we might believe that we are not a good human. 
And so, um, and like the social discipline window, it, there are many times where we will dance around these and experience, um, when we are in shame, experience different ways of reacting to it. So if you can, and, and when we are training, we, uh, we will do an, an activity of thinking about a time when we've been in these places. And, and so our work is to help folks to, um, to reset and to disarm ourselves from the thing that can drive us into shame. And remembering that um, the basis for most of the behaviors that we see from our students and even from ourselves in any given situation is a result of some form of shame potentially. And so when we see a student acting out in school or we see um, maybe some avoidance behaviors and someone's hiding out in our school, that those might be in relation to something that's not working for them. Whether it's the, um, the I don't feel like I can do this, this is too hard, I don't understand type of avoidance, or it feels like people are focused on me or that I did something wrong or I'm a bad person. And, and really knowing this helps to take away the, the deed from that person. Like we, we believe everyone is good. We're all good people. We all make mistakes. And so it's helping to build that in our students that they're all good people and it's what they do in that moment and moving forward that changes things for them and for all of us and helps to build that community stronger. And so knowing that just because you did this thing, it doesn't define you. It's your, that bad behavior is not who you are. And, and, yeah. okay. and, and also to remind um, me, to help to remind ourselves that when we are in shame and attacking either ourselves or others, and the, that it's not about, in the attack, it's not a, about the other person. And so if I am, if, if someone is, and in my role as a school counselor, there have been many times over the years where there is shame coming at, you know, at me in very negative uh, of language and, and that my work is to not take that personally because if I do, then it becomes about me and it isn't. So that's a practice that we bring in, that's part of the four agreements work that we also help to bring in as well. So there is a continuum of practices in the restorative and um, they can be either responsive or proactive. So statements where you're stating that Basically sharing that you care about someone, you're checking in, um, questions, which Lucy's going to get to in a little bit, a small impromptu conversation, which is just one-on-one -on -one usually, a circle, which can be in a group like this or in a classroom or a TA where we have a conversation. Sometimes it's the icebreakers, the team building activities, and sometimes it's a, a response circle of something happened within our, our group and we're, we're trying to figure out what happened and how to move forward from that. And then there's formal conferences, which are scripted. Um, and have a contract at the end for how we're gonna move forward. And those are the types of conferences that actually our student panel um, tends to facilitate. So the proactive, also known as tier one, we're working with the trainers throughout the state. There are 19 um, trainers of restorative practice and or restorative justice in the state of Vermont. Most of them attached to community justice centers so there are two others that are attached to schools. The rest are all community justice center folks or up for learning different um, organizations. So we meet this Friday actually again and we're working to align our training. Dave, you have a question? No. Okay. Um, we're working to align our language. So for, for us, we've been using proactive, which is the um, IIRP version for most of the trainers in the state and restorative justice is tier one response. So when you think about tier one in the classroom, it's the first instruction from the teacher, and tier two is that level of support beyond that for a small group, and tier three is the specialized like IEP one-on-one -on -one type of thing. In restorative practice, there's just tier one and tier two. Tier one is the proactive um, building of community circles, and tier two is the responsive circle. So sometimes it, we try to not use that too much because it can get confusing with those different levels of tier one for different things, but throughout the state, that's what's usually used, so I just wanted to share that. So circles are really powerful. No one can hide in a circle. 
you can choose to pass and opt out in some scenarios, but you're still there. You're still listening. You're still seeing everyone. They're seeing you. It's really important in developing the equality, the safety, the trust, giving everyone the opportunity to take part. Um, and we have, there's different types. So sequential is just going around the room in order. Non-sequential is like popcorn style where it can toss back and forth. It's easier to leave someone out in a popcorn style or to pass in that style. Um, whereas sequential, it's a little harder. You actually have to say pass. And then the fishbowl is where it's a circle within a circle. Um, and there's a smaller group in the middle and some empty chairs. And so the group in the middle is having a conversation and people on the outside have the opportunity to kind of pop in, share something that relates and pop back out. And, and we have those sometimes at, in classrooms. I've seen fishbowls when I've observed teaching in classrooms and also in our faculty meetings at times. They help, they're very much around solving a dilemma. Although they're used in um, classrooms sometimes as a, it's Big not gen. so much the pop in and out as we're having a discussion and then afterwards, how did that go, what's the feedback, and so giving each other feedback too. We use um, proactive or tier one circles in TA at least twice a week, and a lot of our teachers use them in classes as well. Oh, yes. Okay, so these are the, um, the cards that we're going to use for more kind of informal situations, but sometimes um, they can be applied to more formal situations as well. Um, so basically, the goal of these is to get um, either the, you probably don't want this, <laughs> is to get either, um, I guess, sort of the victim or the offender. Um, to sort of acknowledge not only their experience, but also the experience of other people. Um, so this is sort of just like a warm up to sort of get you into the scenario of what an RP is um, on just a super basic level. It's like, if you think about a time in your life um, where you were sort of the offender in the situation, um, like what happened, what you were thinking about, how you thought about it since, and um, how your actions are impacting other people, and that's one of the main goals of restorative practice, is to really get to the root of how the things you do are going to make other people feel and how they're gonna influence other people's experiences. And then the main one um, is what do you need to do to make things right um, because of the harm that you caused. And then this is sort of on the flip side of it. Um, if it was a situation where you were a victim, um, so if you think about a time that you were harmed, um, it's sort of looking back and reflecting on your own experiences about what you thought about when you realized what had happened and um, how has this impacted you in your life. And then also just sort of getting into your experiences more about like what's been the hardest thing for you. And then again, the same question of what do you think needs to happen to make things right. And that's sort of getting to the uh, part of RP that's all about repairing harm done, which is like the ultimate goal of RP as well as like I previously mentioned. Um, realizing how your actions are going to impact other people. Um, so one of the shifts that comes with this, obviously, is in the discipline system. And so when I arrived here, I was told by the other assistant principal at the time that we use restorative practices, and my training was that hard, initially. Um, for the first two years that I was here, it was the questions on the card. But also thinking about how Traditional discipline, there might be a consequence meted out, and we still have those consequences, <coughs> and some of them are dictated by policy and procedures that exist. Um, so there's still, con whatever, there's a consequence for an action, but this allows people to come together and resolve that conflict together, and we're much stronger for it. Even if it's a bullying and harassment situation where there has been something hurtful that's done, been done in that manner, it still allows them the opportunity to choose this. This is not a forced conference, um, but it's a choice that students have to come together and try to resolve what's gone on. Um, and we have used it for everything under the sun, I would say, from individuals, students that are having problems to whole big groups of classrooms or sports teams. And we have used it for adults in our building and with, throughout our district as well to try to resolve some issues that have happened. Um, it allows everyone to kind of be involved in the process. It's not democratic, so there's not a vote at the end, but 
we sort of narrow it down and think about what really is going to help people to move forward when there's been some sort of harm to our community. It's focused on maintaining the community, the relationships that we have, and strengthening them. And what I've seen um, in this, this is my sixth year here, I've seen that students who didn't know what we were doing in the beginning and didn't trust that the adults who were asking them these questions and asking for their input really meant it, come to a place where now they know exactly what's going to happen and now I have students reaching out to me, not because of a disciplinary issue, but because they've had a, something happen before or to our school counselors or to a teacher and saying, hey, I need a circle with this person. Some of them students I would have not two or three years ago would have said, they're never going to want to do this again. And yet they're reaching out and saying, hey, I need some help with this. Can you be in the room so that I can have that conversation with the student? It's and sometimes it sounds like we're not having a circle, are we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, Jody. Yeah. Um, this is used primarily among students. Do you use it among faculty? Yes. Yes. We use the proactive circles in a lot of our faculty meetings. We certainly use them in the beginning of the year um, when we're meeting in our in-service days, and our departments use them in department meeting. It's just practice to circle up. And, and fish bowls as well, maybe mm -hmm. solve a dilemma that might need some attention. Uh, also, if there's been some some difficult conversations that need to be resolved to be with amongst faculty uh, and or departments or you know whether it's with different departments. Kind of thing. Good. And with the administration as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, so yeah. it's comprehensive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you yeah. think about. I'm just going to add one more piece that. If you think of responsive classroom and morning meeting, it starts with a circle. Mm -hmm. So there's restorative parts already in the elementary school. We're just trying to get more deliberate about the connections and the connections that we've been making to fifth and sixth grade, um, and, those, and, and just making it kind of clear for students and for staff to understand how does that overlap. And it really does. I mean, there's a lot in the responsive class in restorative practices. Yeah. And yeah, we have. I mean, I participated with helping faculty, and I've had times where folks, I needed to be part of their sort of circle for action, my own actions, mm -hmm. and make all on it, which yeah. is what sh how the way it should be looked. Yeah, so the board should do the same thing. Yes, Absolutely. that would be lovely. <laughs> uh, and also just a shout out to Bill, and um, that we he helped us uh, in a classroom situation that needed some attention, a US history class. Uh, that was struggled. There was uh, students who were struggling to um, to uh, accept others, and so uh, we, myself and um, other faculty members, and Bill divided the class into three, and we ran circles, and, um, and then came back together as a class, and it and it was a certainly a helpful experience for sure. Yeah. Do strict disciplinary policies that we have on the books uh, tie the hands of this at times? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes are there times where something just has that. to go to that path and there, does it get a chance for yes. this? There are absolutely times when it, there's a situation that calls for an immediate suspension. So physical altercation, a safety mm -hmm. piece, um, our drug and alcohol procedures do that, and a weapons per state law. Um, we are able to have restorative reentry meetings a lot of the time um, to help rebuild and welcome that student back. And I, I'm pretty sure that you've seen interactions over the last month um, where you can see that the students, the students know this is how they're treated and they know that um, just because they made a mistake that they're still good people. Does it, um, is it something that is optional for the people who others think ought to be in a circle? You can't force someone to be in a circle. Right. Yeah. Have you done any comparisons of this standard against the standards used by Soviet realism during the Stalinist period? Have you no. compared the two? Okay. And I noticed it was Harvard Business School that weighed in on some of these. Some Is of the things, yes. yes. So, so yeah. it's some sort of the business stuff model. they use. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Because well, it's an interesting construct. You're it's an welcome. Interesting, it's yes. an interesting construct, and mm -hmm. we know what constructs are, right? They're attempts to explain reality in a certain way. So it's something that um, the Agency of Education has certainly, and the legislator put some money into. Mm -hmm. um, in the past year, they put out uh, $250,000 in grants to help schools move away from that strictly disciplinary mm -hmm. situation. And so a lot of schools are going looking for grant money, um, and we're actually looking to be on the opposite side and to support development of this work in other schools um, mm -hmm. with a collaborative of mm -hmm. community justice centers mm -hmm. and uh, upper learning. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to, if you have other questions uh, of, about this practice, the International Institute of Restorative Practices, IARP.org, is uh, has a, EDU. Oh, excuse me, EDU um, has a lot of excellent information. Um, I'm, go, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and so is part of. I mean, it seems to me like the nine affects. The main part, one of the main things students will get from this when they participate fully is. When you're at the surprise startle, you have a choice of which direction you go. That's emotional intelligence, and that's something that you're working toward. We're working toward, but uh, also it's, it's, if there is, um, that's a whole, and that'll take a lot of time. That's a whole other conversation. We can, it's easy to say we have a choice, and if I'm very grounded and I am not dysregulated and I'm not in a trauma response, I, I can then bring myself back to the present, the idea of staying right. as present as possible. So that's part of the work. And, and recognizing like in the future, you can get control of those a little bit. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, it takes practice right, and right. some un, un, you know, uh, revealing more of the story. Mm -hmm. so, right. Thank you. I'm curious if you are able to measure success with this. So, um, this year we've been tracking a little differently. Oh, do you have an answer, Liz? Well, it is, you can kind of measure success. Um, for example, we've had two sort of contradictory experiences. Um, this touches back to what you said about, um, like, can tr the traditional system sort of surpass this, which it sometimes does. There were um, two situations which were physical altercations, so obviously those kids were, like, suspended or had their traditional disciplinary first and then after we had an RP with them. And in one incident, um, the two people who were in the altercation are actually friends now, and in the other, they got into another uh, incident. So it's like, it's hard to measure success, but usually we've learned like with this scenario, like no news is good news. So like if we don't have to have another circle, usually it's a good sign, I think, but it's hard to like quantitate something like this. We do have some data as far as which, in which places when we have behavior incidents in our infinite campus that are logging them, which ones have we used restorative? And we started a form to try to collect a little more data about what was it for, who was involved, that sort of time of day, and uh, some of that. Um, we also, I moved from detention, which had been formerly every Tuesday and Thursday, after school for whoever had cut classes, whatever the minor uh, pieces of infractions were. And kids would just sit in a room that was monitored by someone who decided to stay extra for a little extra pay. And they might sleep, they might do homework, who knows. And I renamed it community and invited one of the panel, well, all of the panel members, but I had one consistent student who stayed after every Thursday for a while. And we have not had community since the first week of January. So the numbers of students that were accessing detention over and over and over again was pretty high. We only had one repeat person for community, and then now we have nobody. And so I think that says something. Um, either there's a lot more free time so that kids are maybe doing it through the loss of free time a lot during the day, or they decide they didn't want to sit and answer those questions. <laughs> which is what they had to do. They had to sit with the student, one of the students and I, and we just went through the questions, of why are you, what happened, why are you here? What brings you to community as a guest? Well, thank you very much. That was very informative. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna to move to reports to the board. 4.1 is Central Vermont Career Center. No report there. Um, students. Yeah. 
would say that students got accepted to the Career Center and are aware of it now, if they got accepted or declined. So okay. they got that information this week. Okay, so yes, I did it. Yeah, so yesterday, 10 through 12 did not have school. It was very nice because 7 through 9 had SBAC testing. That was what was going on yesterday. And this Friday, uh, stage 32 is doing the children's hour. And it's Friday and Saturday. And I don't think they're ending on Sunday. Thursday. 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 In school, though. Uh, are they doing it? after school. Oh, okay. I think um, and then I guess Ginger sort of talked about it, and I don't want to like open this can of worms again, but there has been a lot of talk amongst students about um, specifically gym and just all the budget cuts um, that are happening. And I think a lot of students, um, obviously they like gym, but they also sort of just don't really feel informed about what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's sort of me and I's job, I guess, as student representatives to communicate that a little clearly, but people are definitely aware of what is going on with the budget of our school, which I think is interesting to see that much student engagement. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll communicate a little bit better sort of where things are at from your standpoint. Oh, obviously, the common student isn't really gonna care about like inflation rates and stuff, <laughs> but <laughs> we can still talk about that. And then uh, next week, the Spanish trip to Peru is happening. They're leaving on Tuesday. Um, that's a pretty big deal, and everyone's getting very excited for it. And spaghetti dinner is coming up. It happened. It happened. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yes. And so they're going to be heading to D.C. soon. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't know about it until Bill said it, but apparently there's a college fair next week, which are always very um, informative and exciting, and it's a lot less intimidating to be able to talk to someone at your own school from a college than at the college itself. So that's definitely a resource for um, sophomores and juniors. That's our report. <laughs> okay. Questions? Let us know if we can help with uh, communication about the budget or anything yeah. else. That seems different from past two past I've never heard that report. I think it's just because everybody is like, loves Jim. And yeah. I think that as yeah. soon as the budget cuts take a personal level, people, yeah. of course, get more invested yeah. in them. Do you have a question? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 seems seem like you have that <laughs> interrogatory. <laughs> <laughs> um, 4.3 administration. So there's some reports that are in the that are in the packet. I know you could have all sent us if there's any questions. We'd be glad to answer those. Um, a lot of, we've, we've met a lot recently, so there's not much on my end uh, that we bring back. And I know we probably have an executive committee. I don't know if we have things to add from the building. We just saw the board on the 17th and last week as well. And the students did a great job of recapping, and I hope you all got the latest newsletter. If you're not getting those, please let me know so that I can make sure you're on the list. Questions? All right. Next up is finance. There's a report on page 14. Doesn't look like there's been any updates since January, so this is not a. No, there there hasn't um, there hasn't been a lot that's moved since January. We're, we're you know we're at the point where we're starting to look at close down the budget. Uh, I know Laurie, Stephen, and I met on that about getting things ready for April as we shut down this budget year. Any questions about the financial report? Um, actually, finance in general. Um, okay. I don't want to be out of order. Uh, I'm just looking at the tension resolution part of our board norms, and um, talks about tensions arising among board members, but not within board members. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just feeling like at that distress anguish level okay. of the um, affect. Dismal. Yeah, I'm, I'm heading towards dismal, <laughs> um, and I, I just am really concerned that um, especially everything we hear, that we're becoming exactly what we hated when we were kids. Um, bureaucrats who are out of touch and don't understand what really makes the life of the school work and what makes an educational experience for a student come alive. And um, I mean, I, I think it, it's hard for me 
obviously, as members of the board, we have to look at the organization and the, um, you know, the, the vitality of the organization, including, you know, the need to right size and, and make sure that we're, you know, we're positioned for potential uh, continued uh, student population declines. At the same time, um, even though organizations are about positions, an educational experience is all about relationships with individuals. So I think that's where the person really, really matters. And I just, um, I mean, uh, sort of harking back to what Lucy was saying earlier about the need to kind of re make changes in the math department in order to accommodate, you know, the, in order to fill the void um, that, that Jim would evidently leave. I, I think that will, that will take time to do. I think that should be done before Jim leaves, not, not you know, try to crib it all together afterwards. And um, it's really, really uneasy and concerned that um, that this is a, a setback, and that from the point of view of the education of our students, in the interest of doing something that's, that may be good for the organization, we're doing something bad for their education. And <clears throat> I, um, I mean, I have a great deal of confidence in Stephen, and I think, you know, he probably, almost certainly has the right idea, but the timing is just off, he's just ahead of his time. Things need to happen before this move can um, can be accomplished without doing real damage. It seems to me. And I just had to. Charles, I, I'd add to that. I, I, I've waffled. I, I've changed my mind on Jim for what it's worth. And part of it, I guess, is best exemplified in the story that happened when uh, when Sanders ran for uh, president got nudged out uh, for the nomination by uh, Clinton. Uh, we had new voters in our town, and they were very excited about it, voting for Sanders. And then uh, Pat Leahy and the other superdelegates said, we're not gonna change our view. And my wife, who's a uh, town clerk, and very proud of her uh, role as uh, chief election official, she, voters who had never voted before came in fully disaffected. What's my vote? We've heard from students who have articulated clearly and soberly their views on Jim. And I hate to think that they would, be, would become disaffected because we didn't listen to them. So notwithstanding the fact that I want to support our principal's decision when we asked him to do this, in this instance, I think I would, I would say for our future agenda, I'm moving ahead, I'm sorry, but I would like to put that on the future agenda to, to ask the, Principle to uh, find a different way and not get rid of Jim. Okay. I would support that. Thank you. So that was one of my questions. And, or, it sounds like a call to revisit this yeah. discussion. Um, and perhaps the best thing to do is, is if we want to do that, is, is put it on the future agenda. So Stephen can be here. Can I ask a John, clarifying or, question? Yes. So are we asking to completely reverse what we decided about a cut? Or are we asking I, Stephen right. to I, I, I think present to us more comprehensively, considering all of the things that we have been presented with, a true plan so that we, we can decide if our decision was worth it? I mean, I, what, I, mean I, I guess. I, I think the question is, is should, do we want to reconsider this, right. period? And, and then we have to figure out Right. Criteria, and then we're going to have another group of people here complaining about where we cut something else, and that's okay. Well, that's well, our job. So that's another that's another question. The, okay. The, the question before us, first one is is do we want to put this on a future agenda? We we've talked about it twice now. Here's a third time. Do we want to spend more time on this topic? I move that we put it on a future agenda with Stephen here, so that we can yes. request that he give us a more comprehensive plan in detail, so we can be comfortable with any decision to. What we okay, so that, that's a motion. I saw your hand, Lucy. But that's is there a second to that motion, Carl? So discussion. Oh, I would just like to mention. Um, obviously, I've already made my standpoint clear about the gym situation, but I do think it is important 
um, for what it's worth to acknowledge that if the cut of Jim is reversed, then it sort of opens a whole other can of worms about the other paraprofessionals that you're cutting because I'm sure they have just as impactful stories, just people aren't here telling them. So then it sort of becomes this whole big spiraling debate about like where to draw the line. Um, so I do think. Personally, that's a big concern for yeah. me. You know, if we're going to think proactively, as it used to do, <laughs> uh, what would be our criteria? Is, right. it, is it the popularity of the person? And do, does that person have the opportunity to engender that kind of support? You know, I, if you I, were, would, if, I would say it's the current effectiveness or apparent effectiveness of the way the white table is running now. That perhaps it's really a benefit to our students currently and and considering alternative we want I think what you're asking for is you really want to know what the alternative is. Right, give me a good going plan forward. that's gonna handle math anxiety and make yeah. everyone who signed this feel like they're gonna be cared for. And you know, it's not getting help from the teacher that you're didn't learn it from, that it's maybe from a different one or whatever. But then I would say that we are recognizing this is a retired math teacher in this position who's taking it as a paraeducator position. He could have a heart attack in six weeks and say, I'm done. And then we have a white table position that we have to get someone who's not Jim. And it isn't yeah. that beloved. And it's no longer the person. I mean, you know, it's yeah. just yep. you, life. And, and it's like we're talking about the individual, not the position. And, but we do want the security that this is going to be cared for because we care about each student. And we care about each of them having the opportunity to get the help they need and feel cared for. What is that going to be? And more clear than just a, we're going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I meant to mention this at the student report, um, but student council in response to your decision about Jim went to um, Stephen last week. And should Jim's posi position still need to be cut, um, we're working with him to maybe develop a student tutoring program. Um, which would obviously have its limits, especially for students in you know like higher level math, like calc and statistics. But um, we were thinking that could be a way to like begin to fill the void left if Jim did have to leave, and we're working with Stephen on the logistics of that option. And that's the sort of thing that could continue, mm -hmm. even if Jim stays. Yeah, and exactly. The um, I, I'm. My own feeling about this is that we gave Stephen latitude to make these cuts. We asked him to make cuts. And we basically said, you take care of that. Uh, and I am as, I'm fine with that in principle. What has happened is that one of the, one of the cuts that he is, um, that is part of this package has, we have learned through in the course of you know, people coming to actually present through students, through um, emails and, and faculty. phone calls, faculty, exactly, that, that there's more to this than, than met the eye originally. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I think having new information is, is grounds, but having new information that materially changes the picture is grounds for revisiting it. I, my own view is, I, I still think Stephen should have complete, uh, yeah, com modified, complete authority to make those decisions. And I'm, I'm really loath to intrude on that. This is an extraordinary circumstance. I, um, I don't view it as something that I ever want to do again, but it's, I'm, elected by my town to actually listen to people and to pay attention to what's going on in the school. And I can't ignore it. It just, it's, and there's, and I'm not getting a whole lot of, it's not controversial. That's the thing. I haven't heard anybody come in here and say, oh great, finally getting rid of Jim. Um, it's, uh, this is one of those, one of those situations where, you know, I hate to, I hate to do this. I hate to encroach on that, on, on Stephen's turf like this. But it's, um, it's not to disempower him or to, you know, um, anything of that sort. It's, it's essentially as, you know, we're a board. We have to operate in public, so we can't just 
go to Stephen and say, look, I don't know, this is not good. You've got you to figure something else out. Um, we have to do it in public. And that's, that's just the way it goes. But, um, and because we are in public, I'll just repeat my complete confidence in him. I just think, again, he's ahead of his time. And in this particular case, we need to you know, have a discussion <coughs> with him about it. OK, there's a uh, motion on the table. Do you mind reading it back, please? Um, yes. Sorry. Um, well, I had that Karen moved that the board consider this on a future agenda and ask for a more comprehensive explanation um, from the administration of the plan going forward. OK. So I will have to say that most likely, if you have a full picture as a board, you will need to have an executive session during that conversation. Okay. <clears throat> it's fine. Okay. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention? Okay, that passes. So we'll, we'll definitely want that on the May agenda. And just so we're all clear, I, I believe that Riff notice has already been. Riff notice is out. You won't be able to cut any other positions. The money would have to come from somewhere else. Have to come from somewhere somewhere else. There's no changing the budget, but mm -hmm. it gets voted down. Okay. Understood. It's good to know. Okay. Um, next up is 4.5, the executive committee. Um, Met, met last week and we'll meet this week and our focus is um, is proceeding with a superintendent search uh, two, two threads one will be um, hiring a consultant to assist us um, so one group is working on that and then a couple of other of us are thinking about contingency what happens if we don't have bills replacement in place by July 1st so we're also considering that and working on you know, exploring our options. More to come on that. You know, it's going to be a pretty big focus for the <coughs> executive committee over the next three months. Anything else to add to that? No, I think that's the work that's been going on. Questions? And policy committee. Is there any kind of report there? Remind me, who's our policy person? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Charlie. Oh, me? Uh, I can tell you that I have started the incredibly boring process of reading through the books. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I have some ideas, but nothing yet to report. Okay. And there hasn't been a meeting, obviously, of the. I, 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 I don't even know what the committee <clears throat> consists of, actually. Okay. So representative. Represent from every school. Right. And, no, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't communicated with anybody else in the so far, it hasn't had a schedule. Yeah, that's good. Okay. 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 Uh, action agenda: We have um, a mid-year retirement on page 23. Bill Dunn. Yeah, this is a this is a support personnel, so it's not one that you need to accept as a board. But we wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. Bill served us for many years, mm -hmm. uh, not only as custodian of his last roles, but many, many, many moons ago, an educator. Do we do anything for long-serving, especially long-serving employees in, who leave? In what regard? Or just sort of some kind of, I don't know if there's a ceremony or a thank we, you. We usually, at the end of the year, we thank everyone. Yeah. Um, though we may have to find another way of doing that, but yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, Great. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Okay, next up we have an end of year uh, resignation. Wait, sorry, did, did you guys have a motion in the second? They don't need to no, 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 just an acknowledgement. Oh, okay. It's just an acknowledgement. It was a long time ago. Okay. So is there a motion to accept the resignation of Kendra Christiana? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention? That carried. And then we have um, uh, a retirement. Is there a motion to accept the retirement? Funny thing to say. Of Denise Delmas? So moved. Oh, 
yeah, thank you for the last name because the letter didn't have our last name. Yeah. I was like, Nice who? I'll, I'll second again. <laughs> nice who. Nice that. Second. I'll just say that this is one of the last teachers that you know, still at the school that from when I was here. What? <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Oh my like gosh. Mark and she Kathy. Yeah. 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 She taught you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's with much appreciation. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed abstentions? Okay, thank you. And um, is there a motion to approve the board orders for $155,399.21 for the period of March 21st through April 3rd. So moved. Karen? Second. I'm on a roll. Scott, yeah. 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 It's like it's easy for Lisa. Lisa. <laughs> the Everest Did you get all that, Lisa? Were there any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed abstention? And that carries. So future agenda items, we're, we're going to be revisiting the white table in May. We've also asked for a presentation on proficiency-based graduation requirements. And I was hoping that we would get student voices and actually teacher voices. <laughs> green team. And green team. Yes. So we're action packed. <laughs> and anything else? We have to do it, get everything in we can before June 30th. Yes. We'll tell yeah. you on April 1st that hopefully you'll have an ESP <clears throat> Con uh, May 1st, you yeah. have an ESP contract to hopefully ratify that. Okay. We have a temporary agreement. Congratulations. Great. And board communication. Okay. Scott's been doing minimum work there. I've been annoying everybody today, so I, I need to, yeah. I think. You get to do it again? Is that what you're saying? I'll do it again. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're a wonderful writer, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since we have a boat next week, can we get something out before Tuesday? Yes. Um, yes. We need to get it to these good folks by Sunday or so. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do it. Prediction right. about our voter turnout for this? <laughs> Abysmal? Lower? We'll all go, right? <laughs> We'll all vote? I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Just saying, people, come please vote. Lucy, yeah. can you vote? I can. I'm 18. Woo! Oh, really? no. Well, we're going to do Oh, she's going to vote against. Math table. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> okay, so, Scott, thank you very much for volunteering. Um, anything else? So we'll adjourn by consensus at 7.40. Okay. Thanks a lot.